Hello and welcome to this wonderful Friday of conference and our special keynote. Chris Deed is the Timothy E. Worth Professor in Learning Technologies at Harvard Graduate School of Education. His fields of scholarship include emerging technologies, policy, and leadership. From 2001 to 2014, he was chair of the H HGSE Department of Teaching and Learning. In 2007, he was honored by Harvard University as an outstanding teacher. And in 2011, he was named a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. From 2014 to 2015, he was a visiting expert at NSF, a directorate of education and human resources. Chris has served as a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Foundations of Educational and Psychological Assessment, a member of the U.S. Department of Education's Expert Panel on Technology, and a member of the 2010 National Educational Technology Plan Technical Working Group. In 2013, he co-convened a NSF workshop on new technology-based models of post-secondary learning. He led, and in 2015, he led two NSF workshops on data intensive research in the sciences, engineering, and education. His edited books include Scaling Up Success Lessons from Technology Based Educational Improvement, Digital Teaching Platforms Customizing Classroom Learning for Each Student, and Teacher Learning in the Digital Age Online Professional Development in STEM Education. Everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Chris Deed. Chris, the floor is yours. Well, Letty, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for coming today. I really appreciate being invited to share ideas. And I want to especially thank Letty and Buffy B for serving as my mentor and helping me get all set up in Second Life to do this. I have been working in virtual reality for 25 years in virtual worlds for 18 years and in augmented reality for 12 years. So I've been fascinated by immersive learning for a really long time. And I'm delighted to have the chance to talk to an expert audience that already is experienced in virtual worlds because it's much more fun to begin in the middle than to spend uh, time just acquainting people with the basics. But I don't want to start by talking about technology because then you have a solution looking for a problem, which is never a good thing. So instead, I want to start with a big challenge that all of us face, which is how do we prepare our students for life and work in the 21st century, a time of a global, knowledge-based, innovation-centered, civilization when what we have is schooling systems that were developed for the industrial economy. And one of the um, things that I did in 2014 was to write a report that talks directly about this challenge. It's available for free on the internet. It frames the 21st century challenge, which I don't have time to talk about today. And then it talks about deeper learning, which is what the National Academy of Sciences recommended in order to meet the 21st century challenge. So what is deeper learning? Um, deeper learning is a variety of things that have been around in education for a long time. And I have seen similar lists to this over the decades that have had different titles at the top. So we keep coming up with new terms to uh, describe things that have been around for a while. Um, but I want to make a couple points about this list. Uh, the first is that these are all things that are traditionally difficult to do in classrooms and often not done in classrooms. So while deeper learning may be powerful, it isn't necessarily widespread. The other point that I want to make about the list is that many of the items on the list involve what in the technical literature is called situated learning, 
which is a fancy way of saying that the context is a very important part of the learning. So for example, if you're a medical resident, a lot of your learning involves the fact that you're in a hospital setting. And in that teaching hospital setting, there are a lot of resources in the context that you're learning about. Now, situated learning is also very valuable because it helps with transfer. We know that one of the big problems in education is that students learn things and they do well in the classroom and then they go out into the world and they often can't apply what they learned in the classroom because the contexts are so different from one another. So deeper learning helps with these issues. The list that I showed you in many of these forms of learning, the context is really important, but what to do when in fact classrooms are very uninteresting contexts. Classrooms are very barren places to try to have people learn about complicated real world things. So now I'm ready to talk about immersive learning. What has fascinated me about immersive learning for the last 25 years is that it addresses this problem of how you get to the deeper learning things. So as you know, in a virtual world, people typically are highly engaged. They develop an identity that hopefully then we can help them transfer into the real world. In a virtual world as opposed to a classroom setting, we can evoke very rich kinds of performances. We can put people in a virtual hospital with virtual patients and virtual instruments and they can learn complicated medical procedures not just as they would in a real hospital but with a better chance of transferring. And the third E that interests me in situated learning and immersive learning is evidence. As I'll talk about later, virtual environments generate very rich streams of evidence that we can use to try to understand what students know and don't know and how to improve our virtual environments to make them better. But what's interesting about where we are now is that we don't only have multi-user virtual environments like Second Life or many of the environments that I've built and studied. We have a whole spectrum of immersive media. And when I first put this slide together, I was reminded of a similar slide that I put together in about 2006, except that slide was about social media. And so at that time, I remember putting up this slide about social media that showed there were different flavors of social media. And I would say, uh, we need to understand how these flavors complement one another. Well, now, 10 years later, putting up that slide, there would be thousands of different flavors of social media. And I suspect that we may be at a similar time in the evolution of immersive media, that a decade hence, there will be many, many, many flavors of immersive media, even though right now this slide is showing a relatively small number because we're just beginning to understand the power of different types of immersive media for accomplishing different sorts of educational goals. So I find myself not just thinking about how do you get the most out of multi-user virtual worlds, but how do you complement multi-user virtual worlds with other forms of immersive media to get the most out of the whole spectrum. Just as if, if I were using social media in teaching, as I do, I would use Twitter, I would use discussions, I would use virtual worlds, and they would all complement one another in interesting ways. In January, we had an invitational research workshop here at Harvard where we brought people from different points on this spectrum together, scholars who studied these different media, and we tried to put the puzzle together. We tried to understand the elephant of where we're going when we use all of these immersive media together. And I'll come back to that issue later in the talk and discuss it. What I've said so far has been very general, so now what I want to do is to try to come up with something that helps you see specifically how these ideas might be used. 
So I'm going to talk about work that my research team and I uh, have done with using virtual worlds to teach about ecosystem science in the middle school. And the easiest way for me to explain that work is to sh have you look at a short video. So I'm going to paste the link to that video into the chat box. I'd like you to not watch the entire video. Just watch the first three minutes and 25 seconds. It'll start to talk about a second virtual world called Forest. That would be the time to stop and come back here. But for the next three minutes and 25 seconds, please go take a look at the video about EcoMove. EcoMove is an exciting new curriculum research project at the Harvard Graduate School of Education that uses immersive virtual environments to teach middle school students about ecosystems and causal patterns. It includes two computer-based modules, Pond and Forest, within a four-week inquiry-based ecosystems curriculum. Here we are in the Pond module. We can walk around the pond and see all the different plants and animals, like these ducks. The camera tool lets us take pictures, and saving the photo displays a virtual field guide with information about each of the organisms we find. We can also walk under the water to see the species living there. And using a virtual microsubmarine, we can shrink down and see the microscopic life in the pond at different levels of magnification. The environment around the pond includes features like a golf course, roads, and houses. Following this runoff pipe leads us to a drainage ditch near a new housing development where we meet a landscaper putting down fertilizer. Throughout the environment, on different days, you meet virtual characters like Manny, who may provide useful information. Back at the pond, the water measurement tools let us take various measurements of the water in the pond, such as phosphates and turbidity. Students can collect weather and population data as well. The calendar tool lets us travel through time in order to see how the pond has changed on different days. Here, it's raining. When we walk under the water, we can see how cloudy the water is. The turbidity is higher, and we can also take another measurement. The data view lets us see and compare data we've collected. The atom tracker tool lets us see what happens to atoms in the ecosystem over time. We can find and track three atoms, carbon, phosphorus, and oxygen. On each simulated day, we can find the atom tracker signs and read a description of what has happened to each atom since our last visit. Here we see an oxygen atom that is part of a water molecule in the leaf of a tree. And then on our next visit, we see that through photosynthesis, the oxygen atom is being released into the air as part of an O2 molecule. As students explore different days at the pond, they discover that on July 28th, all the large fish in the pond are dead. Through the inquiry-based curriculum, students work in teams to collect and analyze data in order to figure out what killed the fish. Once the students have collected all the data, they can use the graphing tool to compare different variables to help them create concept maps that explain why the fish died. Through an exploration of the pond scenario within this immersive simulated environment, students develop a richer understanding of complex causal relationships and ecosystems. The second move. Well, thank you for watching that part of the video. I'll just wait for a couple seconds to make sure that everyone has finished and is getting back. Uh, think of this video as like a case that we're using that's specific, that illustrates some of the general points that I want to make. So one point is that there are teams who are working together in this ecosystem science learning experience. 
Um, and we use a jigsaw pedagogy so that each person on the team is collecting different evidence and they have to collaborate and put all that evidence together in order to solve the puzzle of why the fish are dying. And this creates a kind of social immersion that you're very familiar with in Second Life. There's a tremendous amount of social immersion in Second Life. But it complements the actional immersion that's taking place in EcoMove, where students can not just passively observe the world, but they can actually take measurements of data and store things in a notebook and do other kinds of actions that are taking place in the world. We have a more recent virtual world called EcoXBT that takes things even farther so that students can modify the world and do experiments in it, which deepens the authenticity to science and also deepens the immersion. I also want to point out that the curriculum is blended. That is, it's not taking place only in a virtual world. It's taking place in digital tools outside of the virtual world, like this um, food web that shows the flow of energy through the ecosystem, just as the atom tracker shows the flow of matter through the ecosystem. And it also takes place a lot face-to-face -face in the classroom with teams of students talking outside of virtual world and with the teacher guiding them outside of the virtual world. So the curriculum goes across different media in order to be effective. Finally, um, we're quite concerned not just with what answer students come up with, but why they came up with that answer because we want them to learn not just what's happening in this specific ecosystem but we want them to learn science inquiry as a process and so we have this scientific convention at the end of the curriculum unit where students are doing concept maps and they're presenting their explanations and the evidence behind their explanations and this gets back to what i talked about earlier with evidence which is that in addition to what the students produce as products, like a concept map or a presentation, we have log file data of what each student is doing second by second the whole time that they're in the EcoMove. And of course, that comes with any virtual world. Any virtual world, anything that lives on a server, is generating that kind of log file data. And we spend a lot of time trying to understand that process data and how it can provide feedback to students in near real time, how it can provide feedback to teachers that's diagnostic and formative for their instruction, and how it can provide feedback to us to help us build better virtual worlds. So that's the kind of work that we do with multi-user virtual environments. And I like to think that this is what MOOCs really ought to be doing, that these massively open online courses should not be pushing out video and lectures, which is a very regressive form of instruction. They should be putting people in these kinds of multi-user experiences like Second Life or like EcoMove, because that enables active learning and social learning in a much more rich way than what you find within the MOOC environments. And we know that this is very scalable to thousands or millions of people because of online gaming. So it's very frustrating, really, that the field has had these proofs of concept for a while, but it hasn't really made changes in practice. Now, I want to go back to the continuum for a minute and say that once we felt that we understood how to use the virtual world well, the next question was, well, can we complement the virtual world with other kinds of immersion so that we're taking advantage of the full range rather than just one point on the continuum. And a concept here for this kind of blended immersion where you're blending different kinds of immersive environments is what's called a transmedia narrative, which means a story that's told across different media. Companies like Disney are really a master of this because if you look at Disney, there's uh, a movie there's a book, 
there's a game, there's action figures, there's a theme park, there's a whole set of media that are all telling a story in different parts in different ways. And we haven't been as good in education in thinking about how we could use transmedia narratives to deepen learning, but it's something that I and my team think about. So the first thing that we thought about with EcoMove was moving down the continuum into something that was less immersive, but that might aid in terms of transfer and might aid in terms of life-wide learning, which is to go down to augmented reality. And so we built EcoMobile, and the metaphor that we had for EcoMobile as an augmented reality was that EcoMove was like a flight simulator for ecosystems. You could create kinds of things in EcoMove that might be unusual in the real world, but important to learn about. But then EcoMobile becomes like flying the real airplane with an expert co-pilot where now you've graduated from the flight simulator to the point of interacting with the real world directly. And some of the misconceptions that you might have gotten in the flight simulator, you can remediate in the augmented reality. So again, I'm going to stop talking and show you something that is an example. So I'm pasting a second video link into the chat window. This time it's just two minutes two and a half minutes that I'd like you to watch the video and then come back and we'll talk about how EcoMobile is a form of transmedia narrative with EcoMove. EcoMobile is a program we've been developing for middle school students uh, that helps them to connect with their learning in the classroom with the real world experience. So they've been able to work in the classroom in their science class with a multi-user virtual environment where they explore a virtual pond and they act like scientists to collect information about an ecological mystery that's happened in the, at the virtual pond. But then now we've developed EcoMobile to allow the students to take some of the pieces that they're learning about in the classroom and learn more about them in the real world. So we've developed an augmented reality game that the students can play on smartphones using a 3G wireless network at a real pond. So as the students move around the real environment, they um, encounter hotspots. And at the hotspots, there is information that connects with what they were learning in the classroom. Things like what's a producer, a consumer, or a decomposer, or uh, allows them to take measurements of the pond um, to test its water quality. So the students uh, have been coming out with us to the pond environment and going on field trips and using augmented reality to connect their experiences with the classroom. Wants to know what is the most common type of organism you observe? Um, Honestly, we've observed a lot of producers. Because producers, I see a lot, a lot of green, green and all of these plants and trees are producers. They are produced, so. Yeah. The kids have been very excited to use the smartphone devices and it's amazing to see how quickly they can pick it up and use it to its full capacity. Um, it took a very short introduction for the kids to be able to navigate with the device and to access these hotspots and they were figuring things out and troubleshooting together. They were, it was really fun to see them work together to solve some of the problems that they were encountering and, and you know, one student might not quite understand how uh, something worked and another student was right there to help them uh, figure it out. Some of the, the programs they're using and the probes that they're using are very similar to what real scientists use to monitor ecosystems. And so they're getting experiences that rival what, what real scientists do. And they, they realize that. And they see um, things about the water quality and start to understand what this means for, um, you know, we've had a lot of rain in the last few days. They're connecting the fact that the rain might affect what's happening in the pond and what's happening in their local environment. So they're starting to understand that, that the things that happen in the world are affecting things very close to their homes. The higher, the more cloudy, the more cloudy and the lower, the less cloudy. The less cloudy. I think Great. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the EcoMobile video. Um, both of these videos I've cut off before they finished and you have the links so if you're interested at some point you can watch them further and learn more about what we're doing.
I mentioned that we saw this as complementing EcoMove and as just one example of that. EcoMove is very deceptive about data collection. You click on the pond, you get a number. You click on it anywhere, you get the same number. You click on it again, you get the same number. Of course, in the real world, you find out that collecting data is much more complicated and where you collect it and how many times you collect it are very important. So these transmedia narratives are helpful in telling different parts of the story in an authentic way. But I don't want to spend too much time on EcoMobile because our major focus today is on virtual worlds. So what I like about augmented reality is that it gets at this issue of going beyond classroom learning. But of course, that's true with media like Second Life as well, that um, while Second Life is used to some extent in classrooms, it's used a lot, as you know, uh, for learning at any time. And I think that one of our challenges is to help teachers understand that education should be life-wide and that immersive media can provide very powerful life-wide experiences. So people talk about flipped classrooms, but what they mean by a flipped classroom is watching a video of a teacher lecturing. Well, that's a pretty sad situation for a flipped classroom. Why not being in a virtual world and wrestling with some interesting challenges outside of the classroom. And then when you come into the classroom, that's the opportunity for interpretation and for synthesis and for mentoring from the teacher to understand how to do better the next time that you're in the virtual environment. So these images are from the 2010 National Education Technology Plan. Letty mentioned that I was one of 15 people on that technical working group. That plan um, had the concept that if you think of this as like a clock, the classroom is at about 1030 on the clock, and it's still a very, very powerful method of learning. But the rest of the clock face is about other kinds of learning that take place outside the school place and the school time that we should take more advantage of, that we should link in terms of learning about academics. And I think immersive media are a very, very powerful way of doing that kind of linking. The other thing that I'll say about augmented reality and virtual worlds is that they contradict something that we have been telling students for millennia, for thousands of years, we've been saying to students, you want to learn about the world? The world is complicated. The world is noisy. The world is confusing. You've got to get away from the world to understand the world. Come to the forum with Socrates. Come to the medieval campus at Harvard. Come to the industrial era classroom, and we'll teach you about the world without the world bothering you. And that's true up to a point but now we can also say for the first time in history, but when you're in the world, you're going to have virtual worlds that provide very powerful models of the world. You're going to have augmented realities that know who you are, where you are, how you like to learn, what around you is augmented for learning, who you like to learn with, and how to reach them. There's your social media. So we have all sorts of opportunities to think about transmedia narratives across the spectrum of medium. So where is my team and myself going with this journey? Um, what we would like to do next is move up the immersive medium in another direction towards more immersion and incorporate social blended uh, mobile VR as a blended part of the transmedia narrative. So part of the time you'd be an eco move, but sometimes you'd go into mobile VR. For example, 
topography is very important in watersheds like the pond. And you can get a sense of up and down by watching your avatar move up and down. But it's much more powerful to be in a VR headset and to be walking up and down around the pond. You really get a very profound sense of the topography. So there are some parts of that learning experience that can benefit from full VR. And ultimately, what we'd like to have would be an ecosystem science learning experience that was part in a multi-user virtual environment, part in mobile virtual reality, part in augmented reality, and all of those different forms of immersion orchestrated together. Now, I don't really know how to do that yet, but I'm excited about finding out. Another thing that my group is doing is thinking about other kinds of media that might be coupled with immersive learning in order to be powerful. So we have a relatively new grant called EcoMod. We're doing a couple different things with this than we've done before. One of them is that this is for third grade, so we're moving down into the elementary school rather than staying up in the middle school. A second part of this is that we're adding computational modeling. So we're asking third graders first to walk through an ecosystem, just as they do an eco move, and use the power of the virtual world to figure out things about habitats and organisms, which is the third grade science standards. But then we're asking them to go outside of the virtual world and use a computational modeling tool and create their own organism an organism that they think will be effective at surviving in the virtual ecosystem based on what they've observed about organisms and habitats in terms of what they eat and where they nest and who eats them and so on. And then in the third stage of this curriculum, they're going to release a population of their virtual organisms into the virtual world so that they can see across the different niches in the ecosystem how well they've done at designing this virtual organism for survival. And of course, we can cycle this around so that the students gradually have more and more complex challenges that they're facing and they can refine their knowledge. Now, how well is this going to work? I don't know. That's why we're researchers doing this and trying to study it. I I think the odds are good that students will be highly engaged by this and that they will learn more deeply about organisms and habitats and incidentally about computer science and modeling than they would from just working with virtual worlds alone. So I think starting to ask ourselves what tools can we complement immersive learning with that would be powerful is another direction to take. Well, I deliberately kept this talk fairly short because I wanted the opportunity to have a chance to dialogue with you. You are truly experts on virtual worlds. You spend a lot of time in Second Life and similar environments, interacting with one another, observing things, building things. And in addition to hearing um, questions, from you about what I've talked about or comments that you want to make about what I've talked about. I'm also very interested in hearing from you your own thoughts about this idea of transmedia narratives or what might be a good next stage for us to all explore together as we think about the evolution of immersive learning. So thank you for listening to this and now I hope that we can have a lively dialogue. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so if any of you all have any questions, by all means, please post them. I will uh, grab them for Chris. Uh, there is one question that has been posted already on text chat. It says, how long uh, it took you to develop EcoMove and what kind of resources did you use? So when we developed EcoMove, there wasn't anything similar that had been built. And so it took us a while to figure out how to do it. Uh, we used Unity, which has become sort of the standard programming language for these virtual worlds that use a lot of the interactive components that are part of games. Um, I think now, knowing what we know, if somebody said, why don't you add another ecosystem? Why don't you add a desert, for example? It would take about four-person months to do that. 
Now, on the one hand, that's a big commitment of expert time. It's nothing that an individual teacher would necessarily want to tackle or an individual school district. It might not even be something that a coalition of 12 school districts would want to tackle. But just like Second Life, once somebody builds that, it can be used literally by millions and tens of millions of students essentially for free because once you have the internet connection and a device that's capable of running a virtual world, you can really, um, that's all that you need in order to get the benefit from it. So I think what's interesting about virtual worlds is that there's a front end investment that's required, but then it's very easy to scale them to huge numbers of students as long as you have a way of scaling the professional development so the teachers know how to do this very different form of teaching and learning. Thank you, Chris. There's an, uh, several other questions in here, but I'm going to ask the second one that I saw first because it's related to EchoMove. Echo, Echo um, how can I bring this EchoMove to my middle school? So um, you have a link to the website, and um, the website that's currently on the slide, the URL that's currently on the slide is our overall website. Both EcoMove and EcoMobile are completed research projects, and if you sign up on that part of the website for EcoMove or for EcoMobile, you will for free get a link that allows you to download the curricular materials under a free license from Harvard. So these have been released, and we have school districts in multiple countries that are doing EcoMove and that are starting to do things with curricula related to EcoMobile. Uh, EcoXBT, uh, the third project on the slide, is still in development. We're not ready to release it yet, but in another year and a half, we expect that we will do something similar unless we can find a curriculum company that's willing to you know, work with it at scale. And EcoMod is still very early in its development. So you can bring EcoMove to your middle school immediately, and uh, we hope you will, and we love to get feedback on how it works for you and ways that you think it could be even better. Great. Okay, so there's another question here. Um, I'm reposting. Do you distribute the AR mobile devices or expect all students to have smartphones? We... Um, expect that many students will have um, a mobile device. Now that mobile device doesn't necessarily need to be a smartphone. Actually with the later stages of EcoMobile we use tablets. And as long as the tablet has a cellular component for wireless you can use it in an outdoor setting um, even if you're not within range of wireless. So do all students have that? No. But the power of what's happening with mobile devices is they are becoming more and more prevalent because people are buying smartphones and tablets for reasons that have nothing to do with education that often have to do with entertainment. But then we can use those devices in a hand-me-down way to be powerful in terms of learning. Right now, I don't think that EcoMove would run on a mid-range tablet. The graphics processing power really isn't quite there. The memory isn't really quite there. But in another couple years, I expect that anything that we would build or that you would build would run on a mid-range tablet. And I think more and more families are having access to devices like a smartphone or a tablet and if not, if you really need to supplement devices for some students, then at least you're supplementing something that's much less expensive than supplementing a laptop or supplementing a workstation. So there still are digital divides and there always will be, but the fact that we're able to move down into mobile devices makes those digital divides easier to bridge. Thank you, Chris. There's another question here that might be related to devices. Somebody uh, says, my question is about simplicity. 
uh, this is hard to manage for some schools and organizations. Is there an incremental pattern for schools to align themselves to this over a phased period of time? Well, I think that, that schools could um, modify the curriculum as they wished. So perhaps one could spread the curriculum over several grade levels. And in the sixth grade, you would do the first part of the curriculum that involved you know, learning about the organisms and where they live. And then maybe in the second, seventh grade, you re would revisit it and do the second part of the curriculum. And in the eighth grade, you would do the third part of the curriculum. We try to design things that are adaptable by teachers so that they can tailor this to their own students and their own learning objectives and their own infrastructure in terms of what's available to them. This is also true with EcoMobile. But I do think that there is a floor here below which you don't want to go because this is not a game. It is an authentic, immersive simulation of what it is to be an ecosystem scientist. And if you make it too simple, it's no longer authentic. And one of the complaints that I have about much of the curriculum now is that I think that kids are capable of much more than we actually let them do. I think that third graders could in fact do some of the work that sixth graders do and sixth graders could do some of the work that high school students do and high school students could do some of the work that college students do if we provided the right kinds of supports. And I think these immersive environments demonstrate that and that we need to be careful not to put a, a low ceiling on what these environments can provide, even though we may want to have a low floor so that students who are starting from scratch can make progress and can learn. Thank you, Chris. And I, I so agree with you about, about lowering the bar. It's, you know, students are capable of so much more than sometimes they're given credit. Um, there's another question here that might be related to the mobile issue. Um, somebody asks, uh, what programs were used to create the various projects and are they platform specific? In other words, it, was it an iOS versus an Android? Um, there are a variety of um, augmented reality authoring shells that are available now for free. Um, those um, sometimes are sp platform specific, but sometimes they're platform independent. Um, my colleagues and I have used um, Orasma, which is a, a low end um, platform that's relatively easy to use, but limited in what it can accomplish. We've used Fresh Air, AIR, which is available cross-platform, which is more powerful in what it can do. We've used a platform called Eris. All of these are available on um, the app stores, and there isn't a single great, clearly best augmented reality authoring shell available right now, but I think people are working to try to develop second and third generation shells that are getting better and better. So my advice, if you're interested in complementing virtual worlds with augmented reality, is just to get into the water and start with one of the simpler shells and see how you feel about what you're building and then work up the ladder to something more complicated if it's working well for you. Thank you, Chris. And actually, we are using Orasma in our legacy exhibit this year. So we're trying to, we're experimenting with a little bit of a mixture with the virtual reality and the augmented reality. Uh, so you're right that you have to kind of start small and see where it takes you and then hopefully get more, um, you know, savvy <laughs> in other ways. But another question that's related to this is, uh, and I'm, I'm pulling a couple of questions out of order because they're related. You mentioned already some of the, you know, uh, programs that you've used, but uh, somebody else said uh, you've been creating these environments for a long time. Um, before building in Unity, what other platforms did you use? Right now, we, you addressed the, the mobile ones, but what about for design? So um, before EcoMove, we built and studied for 10 years um, a curriculum called River City. And there still is uh, information available on the web about River City, even though River City is no longer viable. 
Uh, it was built in a platform that some of you may remember called Active Worlds. Active Worlds still exists, but it's no longer a major authoring shell. Um, at the time that we started River City, we faced a problem, which is that there were like 15 or 16 different shells for building virtual worlds, and it wasn't clear which would survive. It was clear that most wouldn't survive. So we took our best guess with Active Worlds, and it was a pretty good choice, but it wasn't a choice that was going to last forever. Um, now I think it is much easier to build, and I'm hoping that as Unity becomes more and more of the standard, at least for interactive virtual worlds that have a lot of tools in them of the kind that we have, that there will be more user-friendly authoring shells that develop that make it easier for teachers, if not to build something from scratch, at least to take an existing thing like EcoMove and modify it in ways that might customize it to be optimal for their students. Thank you, Chris. Um, there's another question that's interesting um, that was posed also. Do you have students who become ill with the headsets? Because I, I've seen also myself some footage of some of the, you know, when you use the Oculus or other, you know, the experience is so intense sometimes. But have you ever seen that in your own experience? Oh, absolutely. Simulator sickness, as it's called, is a well-known phenomenon with uh, virtual reality. And virtual reality can be designed to try to minimize it, but it's never going to completely eliminate it because essentially you're trying to fool the nervous system, your sensory system, into thinking that things are perhaps 100 feet away when they're actually two inches away. So <clears throat> about 3% of people get sick immediately when they put a headset on. Their nervous system just can't cope. And there we take the headset off and we say, sorry, it's not going to work for you. Because we already know that if you're throwing up, you're not going to be learning. For the other 97% of people, typically 30 minutes to 45 minutes in, you start to see some symptoms of simulator sickness. People might feel a little dizzy. They might um, develop a headache. Uh, they start to feel that something is not quite right with what's going on. And for the entertainment industry, that's a big problem. Because in the entertainment industry, as you know, they would like people to be playing these things for hours and hours. For learning, I don't think it's a problem at all for that 97%. Because in the kind of blended environments that I'm imagining, 15 minutes, 20 minutes would be fine. And then you would go back to the virtual world or you would go back to the real world. So VR is a very specialized environment, in my opinion, something that can be valuable, but something that for learning purposes only needs short doses, unlike entertainment where simulator sickness is more of a huge issue. Thank you, Chris. Now, there's another question that's really interesting. Because of the technologies as they advance, there's also issues of accessibility, you know, in terms of whether people are using assistive technology or any other means to expand the audience base of these types of tools. Yes, um, this is something that comes up frequently, and I'm very fortunate in having as a colleague here David Rose, who was one of the developers of Universal Design for Learning. And uh, CAST is located in Boston. CAST is a nonprofit that does incredibly powerful things with assistive learning. But the bottom line when it comes to something like uh, virtual reality or augmented reality is that these are visual media. And so if somebody has very limited vision, there just isn't an easy workaround for that problem. Um, if, if vision isn't the issue, then I think there are lots of ways of customizing uh, to, to help people who are, need different ways of learning, just as there are ways of, with movies and videos, helping people who may not have visual problems, but who have other kinds of, of issues. And I think that building in those kinds of assistive supports is important for anything that is, um, you know, has a curricular base and, and 
uh, in particular a funding source where you're selling something and so you you can afford to keep modifying it and to support many different kinds of learners. Thank you, Chris. We have about three more questions. Uh, we're about out of time, but I think we can answer. We can have you answer just a couple more. One of them, I believe you already answered on augmented reality, so I'm going to leave that unasked. Uh, but you have another one on, uh, did you develop the instructional content with science teachers? And if so, how was the collaboration with them? We work very closely with teachers for everything that we develop for a couple reasons. First, we, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we always start with an educational problem rather than starting with a technological solution in search of a problem. And so we wanted to help students understand complex causality. And ecosystem science is a classic example of complex causality where most people are confused by current curricula. So we worked with teachers to understand where students were confused and stuck. And then we work with teachers as we develop our, our uh, versions of things like EcoMove. We put them out into classrooms. And of course, the first time we develop something, wheels fall off that we didn't expect. And the teacher helps us understand. The students help us understand what's going wrong. We come back, we do another version. If we do a good job, then those wheels stay on, but maybe some different wheels fall off. And again, the teachers and the students help us fix it. So design-based research is a very iterative process where students and teachers teachers are partners in design and partners in evaluation rather than just subjects that you're exposing to some kind of a treatment. Thank you, Chris. And then just one final question that was asked a little while ago, and I think I'm particularly interested in this one as well as I, as I work with um, adult learners. But somebody in the audience asked, do you use this application for adult learners such as college or graduate students, like for example, for learning languages and foreign cultures? I think that there are tremendous, tremendous opportunities, first for using this across many different kinds of fields with people at many different ages, and second, in particular, for language learning. So I would like to see students learn economics in virtual malls and then in augmenting real malls. I would like to see students learn history in virtual worlds and then in augmented realities in their own neighborhoods. So I think that, that this could be college age, this could be very early elementary, again, low floor, high ceiling. But language learning in particular, and I'm very surprised that people haven't gotten further with this because learning a language is also learning a culture. A language only makes sense if you see the cultural context that it's in. And if you can't travel to the country itself, the place where the native speakers are, then having a virtual environment that captures that culture is certainly a very powerful thing to do. I have some students here that have gotten excited about immersion that are working on that problem. I just want to thank you for a very thoughtful set of questions. And I, as I said at the end of the talk, this is a journey that we're all on. We're not at the end. We're not even very far past the beginning. We've got this whole world opening up of immersive media. You have an expertise in this area, and I hope that you'll get into the water with researchers like me and help us evolve much more powerful educational systems. Thank you again for coming to this talk. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. That was a wonderful presentation, and as you can see, very, very engaging. And I apologize to a couple of you who, that you know, whose questions didn't get answered. Uh, but we do have a great program still in the works. Of course, we have the rest of the afternoon as well as all day tomorrow. So I hope you join us, Chris. Thank you very much, and everyone. Thank you all for coming.